know that except by connecting to a new node, and uh, presumably uh, that new node uh, will hopefully, if you're if you're lucky, that new node is not malicious and not trying to attack you, and um, and then it will give you uh, your list of uh, all your transactions. So when you when you tap this button, it will connect to a new random node on the Bitcoin network and uh, request uh, all your transactions again from uh, the date when your wallet was created. So that's uh, kind of a demo of the UI. It's quite simple. I try to keep it as simple as possible. <coughs> Are there any, uh, any questions? Uh, you might want to show how it supports Japanese yen. Ah, yes, that's a good idea. Oh, it is in dollars. That's a, that's a bug, actually. Oh, no, because I have the language set to uh, to Japanese, but I'm still in US USD region. So here's a, I went to uh, settings here, and then um, you can select uh, the currency. And we have a list of over 100 different uh, local currencies that you can choose to show um, the local, the value in your local currency, everything from, uh, from silver and gold to you know, Swiss franc, then um, kind of Japanese yen here at the top. And this will this will automatically be set to Japanese yen if you have your region setting to Japan. Right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, I selected uh, the the language region to Japanese, but not uh, not the uh, like the date. What are the address rates come from? What's that? What are the address rates come from? Um, I'm getting the uh, exchange rates from uh, BitPay, which is uh, a large um, Bitcoin payment processor based in the U.S. I think it, I think they're the biggest. And um, they have uh, uh, really good data and a lot, lots and lots of uh, exchange rates for over 100 different currencies here. So they seem to be uh, quite stable and also um, very likely to be um, the same rate that the merchant you're using uh, is, uh, that your merchant, the merchant you're trying to purchase from. Uh, it's likely the same exchange rate that they're using since, that, since BitPay is, is the most popular. Well, in Japan, they would probably yes. be using CoinCheck or somebody. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yes. that's uh, that's worldwide. So in Japan, uh, it, would, it would be somebody else. So that's that's a good point. That's something that we uh, might uh, change the exchange rate to be uh, whatever the most popular local uh, merchant uh, is in in whatever region you happen to be in. Um, that's not in there now, but that's a, that's a good idea of a feature to have. Uh, one other thing that I forgot to mention on the recovery phrase is that uh, it's using something called uh, BIP39, which is a standard. Uh, I developed the, the, word, the English word list for uh, BIP39 um, a little over, say, a year and a half ago um, with the Trezor guys. Um, and uh, it has things like, it has a, unlike um, the original um, Electrum word list, it has like a checksum so that if you were to um, transpose two words, it would, it would detect that and tell you that this is an invalid uh, recovery phrase, or um, you know, if you, yeah, if you uh, got one word off, but it was still a valid word, uh, then it, it, presumably the checksum wouldn't match. It's a pretty small checksum. It's like uh, it's like four bits. So there's a one in sixteen chance of uh, an incorrect passphrase generating a valid uh, checksum, but uh, it's uh, it's better than nothing, and it's about as much as you can fit in uh, 12, 12 words. Yes, I heard that uh, Electrum is not using the same. Uh, the same um, I heard that Electrum is not using the same bit uh, than thirty nine for yes. its fast phrase. Uh, so, which version do you use? Do you use the bit th the real bit thirty nine or the Electrum way of doing it? No, uh, this is uh, we actually helped. Uh, our, I helped uh, develop a bit thirty nine co author of that bit. So I'm partial to that one, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, uh, they they like I made some some good uh, arguments as to why they didn't like uh, Bit39. Uh, Bit39 was um, because I developed it uh, developed it with the uh, Trezor guys. They wanted to um, have an eye towards really low power devices. So um, for instance, uh, it, it just hashes the the text uh, to generate the C rather than converting the text back to the uh, Original a random value that the that the words were generated from. Uh, this way, uh, if you have a device that can't hold uh, the 
dictionary of 2,048 words for every language that, uh, that there's a BIP39 word list for, then um, you can still um, hash it. Even if you don't have the word list, you can't obviously like, check the checksum or anything, but you can at least, you can at least if you write it down right, you can at least get the money out and move it on the word list. So. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Sorry, Mark, maybe a bad question, but do you have any exchange function with physical currency to Bitcoin? So you mentioned about the, uh, you're connecting to Bitcoin. So uh, yes. Within the wallet, can we actually change the uh, currency? Um, so uh, we don't have any um, ability today to uh, buy or sell Bitcoin for other currencies built into the app, uh, but that is something that uh, we're going to be adding uh, soon. We want to add the ability for people to buy Bitcoin in the app, and we'll be partnering with uh, different exchanges around the world to, to make that super easy and simple inside the app. Um, you're right, you see that is, is one of the biggest shortcomings for a brand new user to Bitcoin, is that uh, they go through this really simple setup process, and then uh, they have an empty wallet. So what do you do with that? Uh, you need to, but if you have somebody who wants to give you Bitcoin, um, or you uh, receive Bitcoin from somewhere, uh, then this is among the, the easiest ways to receive it. It's you just download an app on your phone or you don't have to sign up for anything. Uh, right, right, right. For, for, so at the moment, what are you used to for this exchange rate? Um, the exchange rate is coming <coughs> from uh, BitPay, which is a um, payment processor. Yeah, yes. And uh, they have an API um, that, uh, over HTTPS. It's uh, just a list of, of JSON values that gets updated every few seconds. Um, and we uh, pull that API once per minute uh, while you're running the app. And then also it does a background fetch while the app is uh, in the background. Um, it will, every few hours, it will connect to the Bitcoin network and sync up and also get updated exchange rate data so that uh, you always have a very up-to-date uh, exchange rate data. And for, for those exchanges, what do you use it for at the moment? Um, so the exchange rate, uh, like here, it shows you your balance in bits and then also in, oh, I'm sorry, uh, it shows the, your balance in bits and then also in Oh, uh, okay, okay, yes. so it's just for, uh, it's just for, it's just for yeah, reference you know, for right. you, yeah. so that you have, an, if you don't know how much a bit is worth uh, off see. the top of your head, it makes it easier for you to see uh, approximately. So, you know, hopefully when uh, Bitcoin becomes uh, the dominant global currency, uh, then we can get rid of that. And, uh, I think everybody that. will be wondering uh, what their local currencies are worth in Bitcoin instead of the other way around. <laughs> right, right. But we're still a ways off from that, uh, but so we're working towards hopefully making that happen sooner than later. Interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so back to the, uh, the slides here. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, security on iOS. So um, the reason uh, Bread Wallet today is uh, only on the iPhone, and uh, we are working on an Android version, but we started with uh, the iPhone first. Um, uh, we use uh, the iOS keychain to store um, your wallet seed, and then uh, when you need to make a transaction, it, takes, uh, it can generate um, a uh, the private keys that you need to sign that transaction um, at the time that, you, that you're that you making the transaction. So it just loads the seed into memory, uh, signs the transaction, and then clears it from memory right away so that the, the your private keys are only in memory for a very short time, uh, and only when you're signing the transaction. Um, it uses, uh, iOS has uh, app sandboxing which means that um, any particular app can't access any other app's data. And um, also, all code that runs on the iPhone is signed by Apple. And then um, devices are all hardware encrypted uh, by default to uh, both your PIN code and uh, a UID that is fabbed into the phone. So you have that uh, Apple claims that they don't even know what that is, so each phone has a unique Hard, a key embedded in, in the hardware, um, and they, that is used to uh, encrypt the device. And even uh, like the Department of Justice in the United States complains that uh, iOS is too secure and that they can't uh, they can't crack into it to get uh, 
information from uh, from phones of suspects that they that they seize. Um, so that's I think that's a good sign. <laughs> as far as uh, the security of, of the iPhone is concerned, um, so it's extremely difficult. And you have very strong security, even if your phone is, is physically stolen, um, then your funds are still secure. And also um, between the app sandboxing and the keychain and the uh, the required uh, code signatures, that uh, iOS is is the most well protected against malware of uh, any of the popular. So that's um, why we uh, chose to go with iOS first. Um, Android in version 5 uh, has the ability, I think all Android uh, version 5 devices have the ability to be uh, hardware encrypted and uh, have um, most of these features except I think the mandatory piece of, uh, code signing. So we're looking at that and uh, ways that we can use that to create a very safe experience for Android users as well so that they're not uh, exposed to the risk of Um, so, uh, as a consequence of taking advantage of all these security features on iOS, uh, we strongly recommend against um, using jailbroken devices, jailbroken iPhones. I know that uh, it's very popular amongst the technical people to want to jailbreak your iPhone because you don't like somebody restricting what you can do with your device. But that's exactly what you want when you have a device handling digital cash. You want the device to be locked down and restricted so they can only run uh, safe operations. Um, apps, uh, once when you jailbreak a phone, uh, apps are no longer sandboxed. Uh, any app can access any other app's data. Um, code signing is not enforced, so um, any, uh, any malware can be installed on your device, or you can be tricked to install malware on your device. Um, and it's, uh, any app can access any other app's keychain data, and file system data, and uh, even if you were to encrypt it with a password, um, then a piece of malware could just sit on your phone and wait for you to type in your password to decrypt it, and then uh, you could decrypt the key. Um, this is the same problem with, uh, I think, desktop machines and uh, web wallets and even uh, hosted wallets like, uh, like um, you know, guys like Coinbase or, or other, other hosted wallet Zappo and other hosted wallet companies, I think that uh, they're going to have a really difficult time when, um, when Bitcoin becomes very popular and uh, Bitcoin stealing malware uh, becomes a lot more prevalent than it is today. Um, it's going to be very difficult for them to, uh, to, to tell whether or not this is the, the actual user signing in and requesting a transaction or not. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting. I, I read a statistic that uh, something like 40% of all the malware that's uh, being discovered today is specifically designed for stealing Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is still very small. So uh, that's, that's a big problem already. Um, we've seen um, you know, hacking, a, a lot of reports of, of people losing money on, on web wallets like blockchain.info and having security issues, and I think it's going to get many, many times worse as Bitcoin grows. And, uh, becomes a major global currency, and millions of people have them on their have Bitcoin on their devices. And people who are not uh, Bitcoin geeks like us and security nerds who understand how to secure their devices. So this is this is going to be a real challenge, I think, for the whole Bitcoin industry. And everybody who's working on Bitcoin software needs to really seriously think about their security model and uh, how we can how we can help bring Bitcoin to people and make it safe, so that. Uh, because they don't trust it, they don't trust it, they won't store value in Bitcoin. Is there a way to protect the devices, Um Yes, actually. So uh, I have some code. Well, you can usually detect. Uh, it, it, it is possible to uh, hide um, the fact that the phone is jailbroken, but uh, we do uh, make a good effort to try to detect that the phone is jailbroken, and then we pop up a warning to the user. Uh, telling them that their funds are at risk and please don't put any, please, please, uh, you know, remove the money from your wallet, and put it somewhere safe, or don't. And, and it'll annoy you every time you launch the app, it'll remind you. I was trying to strike a balance there between uh, being annoying enough to deter people from doing it, but not so annoying that then people take the open source and make a, a version that removes the, the jailbreak detection and then post that on the Sagia store. Um, so I'm trying to strike the right balance of, of deterring. 
currents, but not so much that then people can go and find a way around it. So, um, but uh, what it does is uh, it looks to see if the app is sandbox, uh, if it can detect um, files outside of the app directory, then it knows that it's not sandboxed. Although some anti uh, jailbreak detection tools will then re sandbox particular apps. So another thing that it does is it goes to the list of dynamic libraries that are loaded and it looks for the names of dynamic libraries that are common to um, at least all the all the uh, jailbreak tools that are out there today. So um, I'm to show you the code for that if you're interested, but it's, it's all up on GitHub and uh, you can get a look for that. Just prep for uh, jailbreak and see that it's like just a few lines of code that uh, has the jailbreak. So I um, thought I would uh, get a little bit more into the, the guts of uh, how an SPV wallet works. Um, so I know that's a, a technical crowd. I think you guys will enjoy that. Um, so um, what the wallet does is uh, it connects to uh, three different peers on the Bitcoin network. Um, so I think the default uh, core wallet connects to eight. But since we're on a, a mobile device that may have a slow connection or a spotty connection, people are paying by excuse me, people are paying for um, a lot of times they're, they're paying for bandwidth. Uh, it's more expensive, so we try to, to use uh, as little as possible and not choke your, your cellular connection or only connect to three. And um, it, what it can do is uh, it can see if a transaction propagates across the Bitcoin network. So uh, when you send a transaction, it sends it to um, two of the three nodes, and then it watches the third node to see when the third node reports it back to the wallet. So then it knows that, okay, this transaction has successfully propagated across the network with uh, some degree of probability. Um, and then uh, also uh, it uses uh, what's called a bloom filter. Uh, what this does is so that you don't get all the transactions uh, coming in from uh, the Bitcoin network. Or what you get is a, a filtered version of all the transactions coming in from the network. And so this is a probabilistic filter. So um, what it does is it uh, will have all of your transactions, 100% of your transactions that will match the filter. Uh, but then also a lot of extra transactions that, uh, that don't belong to you. This way, the node that uh, that you're connected to doesn't know um, which transactions are yours. You have a plausible deniability. It's not as good a privacy as a full node that connects to uh, the Bitcoin network and receives all of the transactions all of the time. Um, but it does, uh, you know, let's say you might get several thousand transactions and only one or two of them are yours. Um, so you have a high degree of deniability that, um, that any transaction that is not sent to you is yours. Um, and then as I was mentioning earlier, uh, a malicious node can exclude transactions that belong to you. Um, so that's why we have that, uh, that rescan blockchain button just in case something like that happens if you're unfortunate or not connect to a bad node, um, that it will uh, connect to a new random node and then uh, scan uh, the blockchain with this new filter uh, looking for uh, transactions and um, one challenge that, uh, that I had developed that I had to deal with, um, uh, Bitcoin J it, it now has added this feature as well that they've moved to um, Bit32 HD so that you have uh, a new um, Bitcoin address for each transaction. Um, the problem with uh, if you're doing that an HD wallet on it with SPV with this balloon filter is that um, when you generate a new Bitcoin address, that new Bitcoin address is not part of your filter. So in the worst case, every time you receive a transaction, you have to build a new filter and then send that to the node you're connected to to say, look for you know, transactions that might be on this next address. So uh, what we do is um, we generate uh, several hundred uh, addresses ahead of time. And then uh, we put all several hundred addresses in the filter. And then each time you get a transaction, one of those addresses gets consumed. And when you drop down to, let's say, about 10, um, when you only have 10 left, uh, then it will generate another several hundred and then it will update the filter on the fly and then push that to the, the node you're connected to. And um, so that's uh, 
that way you only have to do it every few hundred transactions instead of after every single transaction. So Bitcoin J now also does this, which is a Java library that's like, it's, uh, very popular for So this is um, uh, this is something that's uh, kind of interesting. Uh, it's not very well documented, which is um, how in the uh, Bitcoin protocol we meet, which is um, the, the Bitcoin protocol we meet will have like a list of all the messages that get passed back and forth on the peer-to-peer -peer network. But it doesn't really explain how you put those messages together in what order to actually uh, download uh, the blockchain to from uh, between nodes. So um, this is how the standard client uh, would do it um, if it's uh, was, uh, it was running in SPD mode. Um, what happens is that uh, you send a, a get blocks message to the remote peer, and the remote peer responds with an INV message, which is like an invitation to request data um, containing the hashes of 500 blocks. So. Um, when you request get blocks, it doesn't actually send back the blocks, it just sends back the hashes of the blocks. And then uh, if you don't have the blocks uh, that correspond to those hashes, then you uh, then send a second message to get the data. And then um, you send the block hashes for the data, uh, for the blocks that you want to receive. And then the remote peer uh, responds with um, what are called um, Merkle block messages transaction messages. So um, do people know what a, what a, a Merkle tree is? It's, uh, it's kind of interesting. This is how, um, this is how you can uh, prove that a particular transaction is included in a block. And uh, the way that it works is that um, you have um, a tree of hashes. So you have a, a bunch of transactions down at the, the base of the tree. And then um, what you do is you take the first two transactions and you hash them the hashes of those transactions and you hash those hashes together to make one hash. And then you do that for all uh, sets of two transactions so then you have half as many. And then you take each of all of those uh, transactions in the next level up on the tree and you hash each two hashes together to create a single hash. And then you have half as many again. And you keep doing that until you get to the top at the base of the, or at the top of the tree where you have a single hash. And that's called the, the Merkle root. And so uh, this allows you to prove that you can include just a few transactions and then um, the portions of the tree that go that connect to the root of the tree. And then you just have that, that Merkle root included in, in the block header. And then you can prove that uh, a particular transaction was included in the block without having to have the entire block, without having to have all the transactions in the block can be up to a megabyte size, but you can prove that like, a single transaction was included in that block. With So um, a Merkle block message is like a partial block that includes um, the header and the uh, Merkle root and then the partial Merkle tree. Um, and then uh, a list of all the transactions that match the filter for that block. So um, it returns with a Merkle block message and then a list of transactions that um, belong to that block. Uh, one thing that's, that's interesting is that uh, you cannot just request uh, random transactions from a Bitcoin so if you connect to a Bitcoin node, it will only give you transactions that have not yet been included in the block. If you request a transaction um, that's already included in the block, it won't give it to you. Um, the reason is because uh, it's expensive to index all that information. And so for efficiency, um, it, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't include it. And also, uh, they uh, want to discourage people using the protocol the wrong way and just trusting that the transaction message that they received from a random node in the network um, to believe that, that this is a valid Bitcoin transaction when um, they have no way to prove that it's valid. Because you're connecting to random people on a Bitcoin network, you know, anybody can run a node, could be an attacker, and uh, they can feed you bad data. So with this way, you have to actually, it won't give you a transaction unless you also request all the data that you need to prove that that transaction is valid. Um, so, yes, yeah, so after it responds with uh, the Merkle block and the transaction message, then um, the peer will send another uh, INV message containing a single hash of the most recent block. 
And uh, what the local peer does is it looks at that single hash of the most recent block and it says, can I add it to the end of the chain? And if I can't, um, then it goes back up to the top and sends the get blocks message again uh, to get the next 500 blocks. And so it keeps doing this, getting 500 blocks at a time, and getting a single hash of the last block and seeing if it can connect it to the chain and you can't then request the next 500. So there's um, like four or five round trips on each uh, on after each 500 blocks. And, um, let's see. Question? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the first get blocks that the local peer sends to the local peer does that have like a, uh, a number in it? Like get get blocks 500 from X or yes, um, it actually has um, what's called a, a block a locator array. So what it is is you include in your get blocks message, you include um, the most, the newest block that you have, as well as like several before it, just in case the newest one that you have got orphaned or something like that. Um, that way, you know, if you have if the newest block that you have just got orphaned, you don't want to, you don't want the remote node to then start at the beginning of time <laughs> and give you the entire blockchain again. So you exclude back like the, the previous 10 and then like, you know, 20 back and 50 back. And so you include like a list of, of the hashes that you have. Look at that and say, okay, these are the hashes that he has. What's the next one? Starting from the last one that he already has, and I'll give him the next five. Okay. So, so when you first, because I know that when you first start up a new wallet on Red Wallet, you only start checking from when they create the wallet because you know that there probably yes. isn't going to be anything like that. Um, I was wondering, is it? Does that mean that you? Where do you get those those blocks then to say? I want to start searching from X block if they haven't sent them the messages to the network at all yet. Yes, uh, that's a very good question. So um, I have uh, some checkpoints hard coded uh, in the uh, in the wallet. Um, they're like every every two months or so. Um, three three twenty thousand uh, blocks or something. Like this. So I have a list of, of a few dozen checkpoints, and uh, what it will do is that it will Actually, I'll describe this on the, on the next slide, but I'll describe it briefly is that uh, what it does is that uh, it tries to find the most recent checkpoint that uh, was before um, you, uh, you created your wallet, and then uh, it requests just the block headers um, from that checkpoint without the whole market proof and without extra transactions or anything like that. It's so it about a week before the wallet was created, and then it switches to requesting um, more blocks with the so you respond. Um, okay, so that, yeah, so, okay, so if you um, so you get this IMV uh, containing one hash of the most recent block. Actually, if you just have the hash, you can't see if it attached to the chain. So then you have to request get data for just that one block. And then uh, the remote peer uh, responds with the Merkle block. And then you can check to see if you can connect to the end of the chain. So that's like an extra round trip. So there's like six round trips in there or something like this. But it's not very optimized for, uh, for performance. Um, and, and then uh, if it can't, then it, it, uh, it goes back to the top and gets the next 500 um, and keeps repeating until it has the entire chain. Done. So that's, that's the standard way of doing it. So this is actually how I implemented it at first. And it took like over an hour, uh, even in STD mode, to download the entire chain. Um, so I had to, because of all these uh, stopping every, every 500 blocks uh, and doing like six round trips, uh, it was pretty inefficient. So I made some modifications to the way that the standard client does it to try to streamline it and uh, kind of pipeline it. Um, so that's uh, what I was going to describe here, which is uh, the third wallet modified STD chain download sequence. So, um, where it does is, uh, as I was describing before, it starts from the most recent checkpoint and requests just the headers, which is, um, uh, it doesn't include any remarkable proofs or any transactions that are included. It's just the block headers. And uh, the remote here, when you request get headers, will respond to 2,000 headers at a time instead of 500. And uh, it keeps doing that until it finds um, a header. Uh, it keeps repeating that, um, sending get headers and receiving 2,000 headers at a time. It actually uh, will request the next 2,000 before it even looks at them. So it will try to, try to pipeline it. So it request get headers, and then, and then as soon as it responds, as soon as it 
no response back if it sends get headers again without waiting, without even looking at it. And then while it's waiting for the next uh, response, then uh, it uh, processes the, uh, the headers and uh, checks to see uh, what a timestamp is. And then it gets more than is needed to get up to about a week before um, when, the, uh, when the wallet is created, then it just ignores any of the headers that. that so then once it's uh, within a week, it sends get blocks, um, just like the previous uh, standard SPD mode does. Um, and then the remote peer response with an IMD message in 500 block matches. Um, and if it receives 500, exactly 500, uh, then the local peer immediately sends get blocks again to get the next 500 uh, without even checking. Um, and then it sends get data to get um, the to get the actual transactions and mark a block and the, the tree. Um, and, uh, and then the remote peer responds with this uh, IMV message containing 500 block hashes, which is called get blocks first. And then after that, it responds with uh, mark a block and transaction messages. Uh, so then uh, it keeps doing this, uh, it keeps repeating this until it gets an IMV message with fewer than 500 block hashes. So, um, yeah. So, Jason, why, why, do you, um, why are you using the get blocks uh, since you already have the, the ashes of the blocks you want to request? You can directly do it in the data um, Well, I guess you could do that from uh, the headers from the get data. So, that's a, that's a good point. I might be able to optimize it a little bit there. I guess, um, yeah, if you just get the, well, actually the hashes are smaller than the headers. So the header. Uh, yes, but you have, you have the headers, right? No, because I stopped getting the headers uh, once you get within a week. Wow. Yes, uh, you're right. Okay. But I thought you thought okay. saw something that I missed. <laughs> well, well, yeah. Because I was, I think why you do that is because storing the headers are very heavy. I think it's from something like 40 megabytes and on phone. Uh, yeah, it doesn't store um, all of them. Uh, it stores like the last um, two or three, you know, four thousand, um, like two um, difficulty adjustments. So it stores like just the last four thousand in memory, and then um, it clears them out of memory. So it's kind of just keeping the window of uh, like as it's processing, and it throws them away, and it allocates them. Um, because yeah, you're right, that'd be like 40 megs, which you know, will work on most devices, but um, memory usage altogether for the entire wallet is about 50 megs, we'll go above that. Um, and about 100 megs, some of the smaller devices, uh, some of the older devices will start to make some Yeah, so uh, Right, so uh, yes, yeah, so uh, it requests, and uh, this can tell if it got to the end, not by checking that single uh, block at the end, um, and checking to see if it's connected, but if uh, it receives fewer than 500, then it knows that the remote node um, ran out of blocks to get it. So it just keeps doing that until it sees, uh, until it sees a message uh, uh, containing fewer than 500 blocks, then it knows that it got to the end. So yeah, so it repeats that, uh, those two steps of getting the get headers and the get blocks in kind of like this pipeline fashion where you, you send a request before you process the data. And then as you're processing it, let's say if you need to rebuild the link filter because you ran out of transactions or whatever, then it just uh, throws away any of the data that it kind of pipelined in. So there's a little bit of an efficiency there, but uh, but uh, I got, you know, like using this method, I got, um, you know, I got the, the blocks in. And then also, um, if you have a brand new wallet, it's actually, it doesn't have to download very much at all because it needs the most recent checkpoint and it only needs to download one week's worth of blocks and it can sync in like 15 seconds. So a lot of times the user doesn't even see it sync when they uh, first create uh, a wallet before they're even right down there. If they're recovering trades, it's already done syncing. They don't even see it. Um, yeah, so, uh, so it's going to be. Uh, the look up here, and then at the end, just send get data for the, the last set of fewer than 500. Um, and then, as I was mentioning, if at any point it runs out of um, the, uh, the, the, 
number of addresses drops below what's called the chain gap limit for bit 32. Uh, then it updates the filter and then re requests the blocks after, um, after the filter. Any blocks that, that came in after the filter would be updated re request them. Um, so uh, if, if you don't know that, uh, if you don't know the chain gap limit, um, the way that it works on the, the bit 32 when you're generating chain of addresses, um, how you know to stop generating addresses is when you come across a gap where you have, like, say 10 addresses that don't have any transactions associated with them. And then uh, you know you've reached the end and you can stop generating more addresses to look for more transactions. Yes. How do you deal with the, the fact when, uh, because I've done some more life of swine, I always have this problem with the gap limit that I don't know how to explain to the user if, it, uh, for example, if the user generates lots of address without yeah. using them. I don't see how I can, how I can explain him after after twenty that he should stop to do that. How do you handle that yes. problem? Um, I've been very careful not to let users generate new addresses. I've had a lot of people uh, just whenever they want to. Um, I have a lot of people request that feature, and I always try to push back on it because it, it, it uh, makes things a lot more complicated for the user, uh, like you're suggesting. Um, uh, my, what it does in the wallet is that uh, it just automatically generates a new address every time you receive a transaction. And uh, there's no other way to generate new addresses inside Red Wallet other than to use the address. And then the wallet will automatically generate a new address. That's, that's kind of how, how I handled it. Um, and uh, my excuse, uh, aside from the fact that it makes it make a lot harder on me and a lot harder to explain to the user, um, is that. Uh, Especially uh, for privacy reasons, um, where things are going to start getting more complicated, um, like having to use techniques like merge avoidance to avoid transact uh, different um, addresses being tied together, and you might potentially have to be managing hundreds or thousands of addresses. And that's just even even Bitcoin geeks, you know, are not going to be able to do that very well. Managing their own addresses, and generating new ones, and not to uh, really maintain their privacy. That's going to be kind of by some distributed software. So I think even Bitcoin keeps I don't want to do that. And this is Bitcoin software um, more sophisticated at protecting users against these, uh, these uh, privacy attacks uh, to like, do an network analysis on, on the blockchain uh, network to try to tie addresses together and figure out uh, which address is pulling which, which address is pulling to the same person. Yeah. So that, that's been the excuses that I bring up whenever yeah, somebody asks. That's a good idea because as a developer from the network, they can think about that. I think they would take the right position. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's it's difficult. Um, you know, sometimes you have to say you know other people when they want uh, a feature. That's, uh, I think that's, that's really important for software to, to be simple and elegant and to not just add features um, uh, because you know, they're useful for a very small number of people. You have to the large majority of your users in mind, um, and the majority of your users are not the people reporting issues on GitHub. Yeah, they're, um, you know, <laughs> they're people who are you know, only ever going to talk to you if, uh, if they can get access to the so, so that's kind of my philosophy on it. Um, that's the, the last slide that I have. Um, that's a kind of, um, those were, that was the, the most difficult part, I think, of developing a wallet was the app. SPD and networking portion. Um, there's actually, um, this, these slides are fairly old, actually. I, there's some, some new refinements that I had to do um, related to um, um, actually uh, the way that uh, there's some quirks to the way that, like, when you update the Google filter to the remote node, um, it doesn't actually take effect immediately. So, um, what it actually does that I didn't put in here because it would be too long is that uh, it sends the updated Google filter. That sends a ping message to the remote peer, and then when the remote peer responds with a pong message, that's when it, it, it doesn't assume that the boom filter is like is actually in effect on a remote node until after the remote node responds with a pong message. So since this is kind of asynchronous, where you can send a request and then you have to just wait for data to come back, and if there's no data, it just stays silent. Like that's that's part of the protocol. Oftentimes, that you, you send a request for some information, sometimes. It just doesn't respond, and that's so. How do you, how long do you wait before you decide that the node actually doesn't have the information versus it's just being slow? And when you get around that, you're by requesting a message and then sending a ping message, and if the pong comes back before you get a response for the, the data you're requesting, then you know that, uh, that very quickly that it doesn't have it rather than the wait for the message. Third time, 
take it now. It's going back to the spots it's coming back. So it requires a new one. Um, if they request to move it to some of them. It's not really like, it's not required, um, but it is in the core, um, the, the way that the core uh, Bitcoin node uh, is coded, it does do that that way. Actually, there's, there's a few exceptions, like if you send, um, if you request all this to uh, other peers from, in, uh, from Bitcoin node, um, that one, for whatever reason, uh, you then send a, a ping, it'll send the pong back, and then send you the addresses. So for whatever reason, that particular one doesn't work with, but with all the ones as far as dealing with transactions and blocks, around this kind of yeah you're right you're right I'm sorry yeah it's it's all good <laughs> As far as I see, there are very many competition around wallet, like blockchain, blockchain, or wallet, or whatever. But what is the uh, element of the competition? I, I guess privacy, security, and usability. But I guess that everybody will continue to compete. And I guess that you have many visions to improve your wallet. Uh, it might be a secret, but um, please let me know what, how you are uh, visioning the future of the competition of wallets. All right. Uh, so the question is, um, how do I envision uh, you know, red wallet competition with lots of other wallets and what features uh, they have or don't have and what features uh, that I think will be important for wallets to compete on? One thing that, that I really like about um, running an SPV wallet that connects directly to the Bitcoin network is, um, first of all, it's hard to do um, and hard to get right. So not many people are doing it. So that, that gives um, Red Wallet an advantage uh, compared to many competitors in, in that respect. Um, uh, but at the same time, we also did open source it. So anybody's, I, I want there to be more SPV wallets out there. Uh, I want people to, to come up with new ideas so that we can steal them from Red Wallet. <laughs> Uh, I'm happy to do that. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that um, uh, because it's SPV uh, and connecting directly to the Bitcoin network, we don't have any servers to run. So um, our you know, we don't have a server that could go offline and get hacked. Um, you know, uh, this would happen to um, blockchain like info and Circle and, and uh, even I think that Coinbase maybe uh, in a long time ago in the beginning, um, where their server goes down and just don't have access to your money. So the way I see it, if uh, I lose access to my Bitcoin because your server went down, then you did it wrong. So <laughs> that shouldn't ever happen. And um, the other thing that I think is going to be important, um, well, it's not important for users at first when they sign up, all they care about is convenience and simplicity. Um, but I think 
think security is going to be uh, more and more important as Bitcoin grows and becomes bigger. Uh, and uh, if we, as, uh, as an entire Bitcoin industry, don't improve and work in significant when it comes to security, I think uh, that Bitcoin is going to have a bad reputation and a lot of people are going to get uh, robbed and stolen from it. So I really think it's important for everybody in the Bitcoin industry to help the Bitcoin brand uh, to really increase our, our level of security. Uh, also, um, the fact that we're just connecting directly to the Bitcoin network means that there's no account sign up, as I mentioned. Uh, you don't need to remember a password. Uh, you know, uh, if you have uh, your private keys with your password stored on a server um, and that server gets hacked and then password cracks, you know, a lot of people don't use cryptographically secure passwords. And for obvious reasons, that's really difficult to remember. And then if you forget your password, your money's gone. Um, it's just, People are trained to rely on that, um, you know, I forgot my password button. And uh, if your private keys are encrypted with the password uh, locally on your device and you forget your password, that's it, your money's gone. Which is a problem. Um, and then uh, hosted wallets, um, of course, have uh, regulatory issues, uh, especially in the United States. I think uh, in Japan, uh, regulatory issues are a lot easier to deal with. There's a lot less regulation, but the United States is it's a very big market uh, for Bitcoin, and uh, they also have the most draconian um, regulations when it comes to um, anti-money laundering and customer rules, and so you see uh, people like Coinbase having to uh, shut down and freeze customer accounts because they you know, sent Bitcoins to a, to a merchant or a, a marketplace that happens to items and then they have to close down the account or put gambling sites or things like this um, and uh, that's you know that's really uh, an invasion of, of people's privacy uh, that uh, you don't get with cash for instance and i think bitcoin has the potential to be like digital cash and, uh, so that's that's an advantage yes <laughs> um so uh, how would you know, i don't know So they're really decentralized. <laughs> yes, it's decentralized. I, I'm a big fan of centralization. Um, how do you compare uh, wallets like SPV wallets and private wallet um, when you compare to, say, wallets like Mycelium, which is, I guess, the only real you competitor know, on mobile space, or Electrum, which uses proprietary kind of protocols? What are the pros and cons that uh, people should consider uh, between SPV? Because, uh, and I, I bring this up in the backdrop of the recent fork. Uh, mm -hmm. P2P pool is is yes. breaking Bitcoin in some way. They're like a twenty percent pool, and they're they're minting invalid blocks, and it could really screw up SPV wallets. Um, yeah, so I think uh, there are two questions there. You asked uh, how um, Red Wallet compares to uh, Electrum and Mycelium specifically. Um, again, like I haven't looked at you know, I haven't looked at much uh, of the code for uh, Mycelium or Electrum. Uh, I believe Electrum is open source, so although they're Implementing their own um, kind of version, they're implementing their own protocol uh, for communication to electron servers. Um, it is it is it's open, even though it's not standard. Um, so at least you can, you can look at it and see what it's doing. Um, uh, I think that's uh, not a bad uh, strategy, um, where they have uh, a set of electron servers. Although I kind of like the idea of only relying on the Bitcoin network as opposed to a separate network of the electron servers. If electron, let's say. Or for any reason to become less popular, um, and a lot of the servers might go away. So I hope that doesn't happen. But uh, but I like um, not having to rely on anything except the Bitcoin network. You know, it's a for exchange rate data because you can get that from the Bitcoin network. So um, and then the other question was about uh, a recent uh, issue on the Bitcoin network where um, it's a technical issue where a lot of uh, miners were um, basically using SPV level. Um, uh, proof of um, instead of verifying all the transactions themselves, they're relying on SPV proofs, um, and um, they, they, wrote, they did this in order to uh, eke out an extra couple percent, uh, reduce their orphan rates, so that they're so they can start building blocks faster without having to verify the data that, that came that they were building on top of. And um, turned out that something like forty percent of the hashing power uh, when, this, when this issue happened was, was 
was mining on SDB only uh, security. So um, that was a bit of a problem. That was actually you know, something that I think people it's kind of become less of a problem now that, that we've had this problem. Uh, people are going to fix it, stop doing that, or, or implement ways of mitigating it. Uh, but it is a problem. Uh, with SPV, you're relying on the majority of the hashing power of the network being honest and doing the right thing and actually verifying all the transactions. Um, that's, that's a trade off um, because you don't have the entire blockchain on the phone. You can't. And verify for yourself the entire chain of transactions back to the point-based transaction when the points in question were created to, to prove that each transaction was valid. You're relying on the majority of hashing power on the Bitcoin network. And that's fine as long as the majority of the hashing power on the Bitcoin network isn't trusting the majority of the hashing power on the Bitcoin network because then nobody's checking. <laughs> that was the problem that happened, and so we got a fork. Um, I think that uh, that will be fixed in the Bitcoin network if people will stop doing that or to prevent that from happening in the future so that um, lightweight clients on mobile devices can use SPV security and, uh, and know that their transactions are included in not just the longest chain of work, but the longest valid chain of work that actually is doing the, the full proof of, um, of all the transactions all the way back when the points were created. Anybody else have any other questions? Yeah, did, did you have any program as a white developer uh, against customer that might have lost their phone, uh, their phone? Uh, I don't know, for example, they forgot uh, they, they lost their uh, their seed or stuff like that. Again, yeah, so um, uh, that's also another thing that we see is uh, for Bread Wallet specifically being probably the least user friendly part of the setup process is that is having to write down your backup graves. Um, people don't want to do that. Um, they uh, will do all kinds of crazy things, like take screenshot of the uh, of the backup phrase. Uh, you know, so then you know, screenshots are in your camera roll and they're visible to every other app on the phone. And it's bright to scroll across your television set on your Apple TV <laughs> when you have your, uh, your your photo screensaver set up. So um, we detect that if something takes a screenshot, um, it will it will actually. Um, during, this, during the, the sign-up process, when they haven't seen the, their, uh, any of their addresses yet, it will say, it can detect that you took a screenshot, even though it can't stop you from doing it. And then it says, you took a screenshot, don't do that, that's a bad idea. Um, we just generated a new address for you, or a new uh, backup phrase for you, or recovery phrase for you. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a big problem. People don't want to do that. So uh, we're going to try to make it, we plan to add a feature to make it really easy for you to um, to uh, send your wallet to another secure device, maybe if you have an iPad or an iPod or another iPhone, uh, you can back it up to uh, multiple, on multiple secure devices so that uh, if you lose one and it's destroyed and you're too lazy to write down your backup phrase, uh, then you don't lose all your money. Uh, and then also something that we're looking at implementing uh, in the future would be an optional uh, key escrow system uh, using like a bank of hardware security modules that's kind of like, like your address. Um, is the screen address also doing a key address? Uh, yeah, um, what I think key address is doing is that it writes a key system. address or green address? Uh, green address. Okay, yeah. Green address is um, it, it creates a multi-sig wallet where one of the key belongs, uh, for example, a two of three uh, multi-sig wallet, and they, they have one key, and the user have, have, have the two other keys. Oh, I see. Uh, they are doing like that. So if the user lose one key, it's not so much a big deal. Um, yeah, so that's a, another possibility. Um, he's talking about alternate methods of um, uh, doing it. There's something called key splitting, uh, where um, you can break a key into three pieces, and then one one piece sits on the phone, and then one piece sits on a server, maybe uh, that can be recovered with the with like an email address and an SMS number, like two factor auth through uh, email and SMS, and then the third piece you're supposed to write down. Then, um, if you lose any one piece, or any one piece gets compromised and stolen by a hacker, let's say a hacker takes over both your your phone number and your email account, but then they can only get the one piece on the server, and uh, presumably they can't get the piece uh, that's uh, encrypted on the phone. Oh, there was interesting research recently, and so there was an application Shamir Secrets yes. doing that. That's definitely a possibility to, to do that way. 
implementation. But I don't think there is a real implementation. Yeah. So I think I have actually a, uh, an open uh, GitHub issue to uh, to add uh, secret uh, shares, uh, secret splitting, or yeah. secret sharing uh, as a way of splitting the key up into three pieces so that if you uh, lose or forget one piece, uh, then you're still okay. But even in that case, um, you would still need two out of the three. So if your phone got destroyed and you didn't write it down, then you're still in trouble. Yeah. Um, so that's why um, you know, that's actually the case that we're trying to, to protect against, or that I think is most important to protect against is somebody who doesn't write down their backup phrase or loses it and then the phone gets lost or stolen or destroyed. Um, so that's why we use like a hardware security module that uh, is tied to like an email address, a pin code, and, uh, and like an SMS number, and you have to have all three. And uh, we have no way to access it because we don't have the pin code. And even though pin code would be very easy to crack offline, uh, the key is sitting in a hardware security module that enforces a limited number of pin code attempts and then destroys the key if you get it wrong like three times or something like that. And then uh, you know, maybe that would be a service that we charge for as a potential revenue stream or something like that. Only we need to do the recovery. So it's, a, it's an option so that if you don't trust us, still do it the way we're doing it now where you write it down and we don't see anything about you at all <laughs> except the a number of downloads in the app store um, for, for people who, so that you don't even have to trust us um, but then for people who want that added security and don't want to be responsible for themselves uh, because they trust other people um, you know they trust themselves which is what you know, I can use gmail for email even though i can set up a mail server because Engineers at Gmail are better at it than I am. They do a better job. So um, that is a service that, that we're hoping to offer to make it a lot easier for uh, regular people who, you know, are gonna, not going to do the right thing. They're going to do the easy thing. So we're going to make the easy thing also the right thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess that Fastplay is will create private key. Is it made by your own algorithm? Standard by BIPs. Um, so the uh, the question is, how do we uh, generate the private keys? Um, so I am using um, Apple's uh, security framework uh, called uh, Common Crypto, and uh, there is a, a Common Crypto function to request a cryptographically secure uh, random number or entropy, uh, and it gets 128 bits of entropy. And then it uses that 128 bits of entropy and encodes it using BIP39 into that recovery phrase. And uh, we use uh, 128 bits uh, because we want it to be as small as possible so that the recovery phrase is short and easier to write down. Uh, but then we don't want to um, you know, compromise any security. So uh, at 128 bits is kind of the point where you get diminishing returns. You can go up to 256 bits. Uh, but um, uh, one of the core pieces in Bitcoin is ECDSA. Uh, that's a 256-bit ECDSA, uh, elliptic curve digital signature. And um, the strength of an uh, ECDSA signature is about half the order of the curve. So a 256-bit um, elliptic curve uh, digital signature has about 128 bits of strength. So that's why we use 128 bits for of entropy as the wallet seed as well, because after that, you don't really get a lot of extra security above that. So. I have a question uh, about your thoughts on the responsibility of open source projects. Uh, and in specific, uh, blockchain.info's wallet has had many uh, debacles in the, in the past couple of months. Uh, and, you know, while they you know, are open source to an extent. Uh, you can tell that they aren't using the most, uh, the best practices in development uh, procedures, uh, I would say. Um, but at the same time, they still, because they have so much money, they have been kind of, you know, refunding users who were lost, uh, who lost funds due to their mistakes. So I guess that's kind of, okay in the end, if you want to see it that way. But uh, I want to see what your uh, thoughts are on the responsibility of, of, of open source. So like, if someone uses your wallet, even though technically 
in your license agreement you say we, we provide this service as is, uh, we're not responsible for how you use it. Uh, if it was a bug that was in your system that caused a user to lose, say, 100 bitcoins, how would you feel uh, the responsibility of that loss uh, is pertains to Red Wallet as a company? Um, yeah, so uh, he was asking about uh, um, <coughs> other Bitcoin open source projects and um, how some of them that are well funded uh, made mistakes but then refunded users and um, what what our plan is and um, what other open source projects should be doing uh, with respect to that. Um, the first thing I want to say is that I have huge respect for um, what blockchain.info has, has done in the past in bringing Bitcoin to, to millions of people. <laughs> and I'm really glad that they did that. Uh, and I, I am sad to see uh, some of the mistakes that they've made and that they've uh, lost some money, but I'm glad to see that they've reimbursed people. Uh, I hope that uh, I hope that they uh, get better uh, with their with their processes and, uh, and use uh, the quality of their their software improves security wise. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's that's good that uh, that they've chosen to uh, refund users when they make mistakes. Uh, but I think that um, a company like that they should uh, you know if if they want people to trust that, um, then they should actually offer insurance against that, like have an official policy where they may have a promise to that effect. And then, um, you know, that insurance, because if they have a, a really big breach and they lose, you know, millions of dollars, uh, many millions of dollars, it would be a problem if they wouldn't be able to do that. So I think that they should have, they should carry insurance against a uh, 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 problem like that. And then that will encourage them to save money on their insurance bills by uh, is maybe the insurance company will, will force them to use better uh, business practices or better coding practices uh, uh, so that the, to reduce their premiums or something like that. You know, there's, to, to create incentives like that. Um, as far as uh, uh, Bread Wallet uh, is concerned, um, it is open source and, and I've done the very best that I can to, uh, to create something but to be very careful and create something as secure as possible. Uh, we haven't had any reports of anybody getting hacked or, or losing coins other than from uh, forgetting to write down their backup phrase and having their phone destroyed. That, that has happened to a few people so far, um, thankfully, no reports of any major losses in the, in the minor bits. So that's something that, uh, that we feel um, responsibility for. If people are not writing down their backup phrase, I feel like that's uh, my failure for not making it easier to do. And uh, so that's why we want to implement those extra features that we were talking about before to make it easier to for people to, to uh, you know, protect their funds against the phone the loss they're stolen. Yeah. Uh, more, the more SP knows and the less that who knows uh, about the box as well. Uh, what items do we get to uh, we want to do in the yeah, future? Okay, um, so this is this is a good uh, observation. Uh, he, he mentions that uh, what's your name again? Tomaki. Tomaki, Tom yes. Uh, he uh, Tomaki mentions that uh, that there are more and more SPV nodes and fewer full nodes running, and uh, that this uh, this obviously is going to cause problems eventually. Um, if they if Red Wallet becomes a huge success and there are hundreds of millions of people using it, uh, that's going to put significant load on. Um, so our plan is um, uh, two things that we're going to do. We're going to um, uh, run our own full nodes on, on the Bitcoin network um, to help um, alleviate load and contribute to, to the pool of full servers uh, to make sure that, uh, well, not just to help the Bitcoin network, but we have a selfish uh, reason too that we want Red Wallet users to have a good experience and to connect, have lots of fast full nodes to connect to, to, to download, to sync quickly so they have a good user experience. Because that affects uh, Red Wallet users as well, not just the Bitcoin, not just the rest of the Bitcoin network. Um, and then also, um, we uh, have plans. Uh, Matt Corallo and Mike Kern wrote the, um, the code to serve SPV nodes in the core client. Uh, and uh, I spoke with them uh, about possible optimizations that could be made. Uh, and Mike Kern said that they pretty much just implemented it to get it working and haven't done any optimizations or run through a profiler or anything yet. 
So hopefully there's lots of looking and fruit to improve the, uh, the performance of, so that an SPV client uh, puts less load on full node. Um, so yes, we, that's our plan is to, to, opt to help uh, improve uh, the Bitcoin core code to make it more efficient to serve lots and lots of SPV clients and then also provide more uh, full nodes ourselves to, to lift the load. And if we are successful and have hundreds of millions of users, then uh, that uh, something that we got to be able to do. And we'd be happy to do that. Uh, is the modified network protocol itself hasn't changed? Yes, exactly. It would, it would be just standard full nodes um, and uh, Red Wallet, you know, connect to our nodes just like any other random node. And except, you know, if, if we were running the node, then we could make sure that at least those particular nodes were not trying to do anything malicious. Um, so we have an obvious incentive to, to provide the best service that we can and to make it fast. So protect uh, you know, any privacy um, issues like the Bitcoin filter to make sure that uh, we don't store any logs or anything that can be analyzed uh, to uh, reduce user privacy. So I think it would improve the improvement all around. Uh, yeah. What's your uh, yeah, so um, as I mentioned, uh, right now it's, it's an open source app. It's available free on the App Store, um, and uh, we don't charge any fees for sending Bitcoin transactions other than the standard Bitcoin network fees. And uh, our goal for um, earning revenue in the future, um, the first feature that we're going to add, as we mentioned, was partnering with the Bitcoin exchanges to make it easy to buy Bitcoin in the app. That's probably going to be our first revenue stream we'll do uh, since we're sending the exchanges, uh, customers, and, and volume, and they charge uh, a transaction fee or a spread on the transaction. Um, we work out deals with the exchanges to uh, to give us uh, a portion of that revenue uh, in exchange for sending the traffic. And then uh, we'd like to add other financial services in the future too, like maybe um, the ability to uh, earn interest on your Bitcoin by loaning it out or yeah, uh, Nicholas had his hand up just for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, replace by fee. What do you think? Uh, okay, uh, replace by fee is. Um, let's see, I think that it's difficult for the use case where you have a mobile wallet that doesn't stay connected. Um, uh, as uh, as Peter has pointed out on the development mailing list, um, it doesn't hurt to have um, at least the first the first seen safe version of replaced by fee. Um, it doesn't hurt to have that as an option. It's just a, a new ability to get a transaction unstuck uh, that you didn't have before. But um, I think the goal for for Bread Wallet will always be to choose the correct fee and, uh, from the start rather than trying to implement uh, some sort of replaced by fee mechanism where you have to go back and try to fix a broken transaction. If yeah, we have to do that, we've already, we've already screwed up. So, that's as far as I So, uh, yes, I have two questions. I'm uh, actually responding to this one. Uh, one, how do you deal with calculating the place? Because right now, in my in the wallet, I'm developing and just taking the minimal relay piece of the coin and then uh, checking the size of the transaction and then. Right, please, but as, you, as uh, we have seen, uh, I think uh, last week, there was a large spam attack on the network, and so the wallet I was developing, the transaction got stuck. So I'm curious, what what uh, what is your what is your how do you calculate the the fees of your bread wallet? So the question is, uh, how do I calculate uh, fees for a bread wallet? Um, yes. So uh, originally, I was doing what, what you just mentioned, which was just putting in the minimum relay fee, and it was working fine. Uh, but then uh, over the last uh, several months, uh, that started not working so well. So I started uh, I have like a fixed fee that's that's higher than that. Um, that was like I just doubled it to, um, to twenty uh, bits per kilobyte or something like this. Um, uh, but then uh, recently, what I've done is. Um, implemented, we had an issue where um, a user got a, somebody sent them a 0 0.1 Bitcoin uh, transaction with no fee on it uh, that 
that was low priority. So it was like a free transaction with really low priority. And then they sent their entire wallet balance to some to some other wallet. And because it that that entire balance got stuck because it couldn't confirm until the 0 0.1 so uh, we've implemented something called a child case for parents, where uh, when you are spending uh, something that somebody sent to you that is not yet confirmed, it will uh, add a fee to cover both that transaction as well as yours, and some uh, small portion of the uh, hashing power on the network supports uh, child case for parent, and will actually look at the entire chain of transactions and add up the fees, and then compare the fees of the size of both the transaction and the child transaction. It's, it's implemented in call? It's implemented on um, Luke Jr.'s uh, Elegious pool, and I think uh, some other uh, caching power is, uses his patches as well. Um, so some small percentage uh, uses it enough that you can get the transaction unstuck. It might take several hours, but at least it will take like, days. Um, and so then, uh, in order to do that, we actually uh, is a minimum fee getting into a Legis pool is actually uh, about a quadruple what the uh, what the minimum relay fee is. So that's actually in the new version we, we pumped it up to that. And uh, that's what we're using as a minimum fixed fee per uh, kilobyte. It's just uh, the minimum required by a Legis pool, which is also high enough to do pretty well against uh, you know, other transactions on the network. It's kind of right in the middle of the range. So it seems like a good place to be for now. And then in the future, um, you know, hopefully they'll, uh, not to get into too much rancorous debate, but I'm in favor of increasing the size the, of the, the maximum size of blocks above one megabyte um, so that uh, we don't run into situations where transactions are getting dropped and you don't know if your transaction is going to get in or not until, until afterward. Um, so, but if that does happen, uh, then we'll have to implement a service that monitors uh, congestion of the Bitcoin network in real time. To trust the service to tell you what fee uh, you need to pay to get in right now, since since your wallet's not connected all the time. Um, we, we got a company called Block Cipher to add their recommended uh, fee to their API so that we can clean that and get the, the currently the current fee per kilobyte that you need to keep your transaction in a timely manner, according to them. And a lot of merchants, uh, as the shapeshift.io, Using them to judge um, the confidence level of the transaction that they receive to see if, if uh, they can trust it either way or yet. So, so that's, I think, hopefully, they have a good incentive to give good data and to you know, use sophisticated algorithms to, to, try to, to try to make zero confirmation transactions uh, confirm quickly because that's their whole business. So. Okay. And then, uh, another question uh, was. Have you thought about adding insurance in Web1 because we are talking about the possibility of people to lose money? So we can we can we can imagine a system where every time the customer makes a transaction, there is a small small percentage of the transaction that goes to an insurer address, for example. Have you we probably would do it uh, per transaction, we probably do it based on like the amount of money in your wallet. Coverage up to this this amount or the higher amount. Um, the uh, what our plan is, uh, what we think um, will happen with uh, multi sync services is that uh, eventually they'll kind of evolve uh, to services where you pair your wallet with a multi sync service, and then uh, that service will um, auto sign any transaction that you send it according if it falls um, within. Uh, some sophisticated fraud detection algorithms, maybe similar to what credit card companies are using. Um, so we think eventually their their algorithms, instead of just being standard like uh, daily maximums, will actually uh, turn into something more complicated like sophisticated fraud detection algorithms. And then that uh, that service might include insurance, um, where you know they are will insure your money, uh, and then they can run fraud detection and stop any transactions that they think uh, you know might be theft. Have an incentive and both know like just exactly how secure their algorithms are and what the risks are so they'd be in the best position to give you the best price on insurance since they know what the risk level is 
better than anyone else. So that's how we would manage. I don't think we would do it ourselves, but we would uh, partner with uh, Sync Services and then you know, use our same model that we're going to use with exchanges, which is uh, we'll send you customers and give us some money. Yeah. 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 Centralized nodes, uh, centralized web nodes, or the web core change uh, where we'll solve the problem you, you are coming with. Uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, more than uh, what, what level of uh, uh, SPV nodes and uh, ratio of the uh, SPV nodes, but the nodes is a dangerous point. And also, at some point, uh, what kind of attacks are you expecting with uh, uh, SPV nodes? And then how do you miss your points? Um, so, if I understand your, your question right, you're asking uh, like what ratio of SPV wallets to nodes uh, where it starts to become problematic? Yes. Um, I I really need to, to look into that. Uh, right now, um, we haven't had any issues yet or, or any reports of uh, people having problems, so we haven't really like, uh, tried to stress test it and see just how many, uh, just how many SPV clients can connect to a full node at once. Crashes. It, it really would vary on the hardware that the full node is running on. Um, you know, whether it's um, running on you know, Raspberry Pi, a little uh, you know, computer versus uh, you know, a big server and a co location facility, I think it really depends on, on the machine itself. So that would be kind of difficult to judge. Um, but yeah, I think uh, you know, when we get to maybe you know, 10 times the number of users that we have. Now that's uh, that's something that's more definitely for, or if we start noticing problems where where people are having having problems with the uh, slow sync times, uh, that's when uh, you know we'll be very incentivized to uh, run our own nodes on Bitcoin network to improve sync times for our users. So when our users start seeing degraded degraded performance. That's going to be a big uh, uh, fire under your under your bottom to get them to it. So. <laughs> So the, in this case, uh, what kind of attacks will happen? Uh, how do you see this? Like, uh, yeah, many yeah, civil attacks? Um, civil attacks? Um, well, I guess if somebody wanted to attack the network, they could, um, they could set up lots of nodes that then um, don't go um, through the transactions or lie about you know, some of the transactions. Uh, double spends, you can the amount of transactions included in the blockchain, but uh, they can leave out transactions. So that's one attack that, that could be done. There's like lots of signal nodes, and we put up a bunch of malicious nodes in the network. Um, we try to do things, try to detect nodes that uh, we have had issues with nodes in the past that were trying to uh, kind of monitor the network, uh, but then save on resources by not syncing uh, what I do connect with them. And so we had to add um, some. Detection to uh, to detect when a node uh, was misbehaving and not behaving in standard fashion, so that we can just connect to it and try another one. Um, but that's you know, if somebody was actively trying to trick the wallet, um, that would be more difficult. It would be kind of uh, cat and mouse game where they would, they would, we would have to we would have to implement new features to detect what tricks they're using. But so far, nobody's you know, you know, had malicious attacks of that kind. But then, if we were running our own nodes, then that would help with that because, of course, we would know that those nodes are, are not going to be attacking our users. We can, we can maybe have uh, Bread Wallet prefer our uh, you know, Bread Wallet nodes, uh, but then connect to any random node on the network if our nodes aren't available for whatever reason so that you're not relying on us. So, finally, the users will uh, have, to, uh, <laughs> so you have to trust the yeah, Bread Wallet nodes. Um, well, so uh, this is true actually of full nodes too, right? Uh, it's the, the blockchain is cryptographically secure, but uh, the peer to peer protocol, um, there are um, you know, denial of service attacks and other ways that you can, you can attack it. And that's actively being worked on is how to solve those problems. Um, they call it a, a gossip network, even where that's the, the name that they use is that. Uh, People are, are passing messages back and forth, transactions and blocks, but you know none of it is verified until you verify it yourself. So it's really just like a lot of gossip. People just bring stuff back and forth between each other, and you don't know what's true and what's not until you verify it yourself. So, so 
but this is uh, it's not just a problem for it. It's, uh, it's an issue for all the There's uh, they're working on, on ways to uh, to uh, make it harder to attack the Bitcoin network. One thing I was thinking of hearing this question was: uh, Does Bread Wallet check for proof of work, or does it just check to see if the hashes are connected? I guess so, like. So like it, it checks to make sure every twenty six thousand blocks that the difficulty is actually changing and that it actually meets the difficulty requirements. Yes. Yeah, so the question is if if Red Wallet does uh, actual uh, check with proof of work and yes it does. That's uh, you, you need to do that for um, for SPV so that somebody doesn't just create a really long chain of block headers that don't have valid proof of work and then you say well that's the longest chain but it's not the longest valid chain. So we do. Uh, to do the, the difficulty adjustment calculation. Yeah, because one of, one of the things I was thinking was is if there were all these SPV nodes that were using up all of the bandwidth of a small number of full nodes, one problem might be is someone kind of creating their own fake blockchain and starting up nodes that kind of call themselves the Bitcoin network, but it's just like a fraud network to like defraud red wallet users kind of. Yeah. But you know, they would have to be able to fraud after your most recent checkpoint would be the problem. Yes. Yeah. Um, it, it would be expensive to do. So yeah. um, you know, if you can do that, then uh, you can you know, just hack the network. Or you could just make money, you know, money right point. Yeah, or you can do that. But uh, you had a question in the back of the home. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm just wondering what is Red Wallet's business model. I think like, I asked yeah. that. Yeah, oh, we did. Oh, I asked that question before, but I'll just go over it again briefly. Is that um, you know it's a, it's a free app, it's open source. Um, we don't charge for transactions, but uh, we want to charge for additional financial services. Um, the, the first thing that we're going to add is the ability to buy Bitcoin. We'll partner with exchanges, and then um, those exchanges charge a fee for transactions, and then they'll give us you know, part of that revenue for. Um, I'm very impressed that you have profound thinking about security and the whole ecosystem. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's quite difficult to manage all SPV full node and Chinese miners and one megabyte or 20 megabytes. And um, what do you think about how how are you influential to the whole ecosystem? And what do you think about one meg one, one meg or 20 meg? Um, so I have uh, responded. Uh, the question is, uh, what do I think about Block size limit debate and um, how I have any influence, I guess. <laughs> um, I, I hope that I have that people at least uh, take my opinions uh, seriously. Um, I'm not, not committed to the core code, so I don't have any direct influence other than uh, just trying to make um, rational arguments. Um, I've, I've discussed, I've sent uh, emails on the Bitcoin development mailing list uh, where the people are going to be making the decision about what goes into Bitcoin XT or Bitcoin Core for the popular software that all the, the miners are running today. Um, so they have the most practical influence over how it's going to play out with the code quality. So I've contributed my opinions on, on the Bitcoin development list. Um, again, by the way, my opinion for is that uh, we need to uh, increase the block size. Um, I think that. In order to keep the network functioning the way that it functions today, um, where uh, when you submit a transaction and uh, it propagates across the network, you have a high degree of confidence that it will eventually get mined. Uh, and I think that's, that's an important property of, of uh, the way that the Bitcoin network works. And if that stops being the case, it's going to break a lot of software that uses the Bitcoin network. Um, although we do have uh, plans in place to try to deal with the issue as best we can. I think that it is going to hurt the user experience for a lot of Bitcoin users, and it's going to uh, it's going to hurt Bitcoin adoption. Um, the other issue is that uh, people uh, want to, the argument in favor of keeping blocks, uh, keeping the minimum block size, is that uh, larger blocks will cause fewer people to run full nodes, and then that causes centralization that gives uh, a loss of uh, one of the key features of Bitcoin that makes it valuable. And I also agree that we need to uh, 
put um, something in place to encourage people to conserve on locksmiths. I think that decentralization is the most important thing. And I think that having uh, fixed uh, block size, maximum block size, is a bad way to achieve the goal of getting people to economize on using the blockchain. I think that you can do that by um, increasing the minimum relay fee and uh, having more sophisticated algorithms for miners to um, to delay but not fail uh, transactions that are valid but including, let's say, a marginal fee. Um, those are the ways that you can use to create fee pressure uh, and higher fees cause people to voluntarily um, economize on use of block space. And that's the right way to do it. You want to control space with fees, not controlling fees with fixed space. That's like that. It's like a fixed production floor. And I think that's, uh, frankly, it's, it's economically illiterate to think that you can control um, use by, by controlling production instead of controlling the cost. So that's my opinion. Thank you. <laughs> So this question is uh, with the bloom filter. Um, there's uh, some adjustments that you can use to adjust um, how many false positives you get, how much extra stuff in addition to your own transactions you get. And obviously, the looser you, you make that setting, so that you get lots of extra transactions that improves your privacy because then you have it's hard to tell which ones are yours. But then you decrease your performance because you're now doing a lot of extra data. So um, what we do is we have um, like two settings. Um, if you're syncing the, your entire wallet and your entire wallet is, let's say, a year old, it, uh, it reduces the false positive rate so that it can sync the wallet within like 10 minutes. Um, uh, but then if you're uh, close to being synced or if your wallet is new and you're resyncing a wallet that's fairly new, um, it will increase the false positive rate so that it still syncs you know, fairly quickly, um, but then you get better privacy. So um, it does reduce your privacy somewhat. Um, if you have a really old wallet, um, you need to resync it to try to improve the performance so that it can take 20 minutes or a half hour to sync it. So that's uh, a trade-off that we do. It's a trade-off between uh, good privacy and performance. So, so we try to, um, when performance is less critical, Um, in regards to the SPV uh, protocol, uh, if there's one feature that you wish would be widely adopted by all full nodes to make your wallet perform better or uh, make your job a lot easier, and you could magically have it just implemented throughout the entire network tomorrow, <laughs> one wish, uh, what, what feature would you add? Uh, that's a good question. There's a few that come to mind. Uh, one thing that uh, I think would be really nice would be uh, a way for SPV clients to better estimate fees. Um, or um, that's something that one I really don't like the idea of having to move to uh, service and update fees. I wish that SPV clients had all the information. Don't, don't full nodes after 0 0.10 uh, calculate, like, estimate like one block confirmation fees or something? You can do yes. it with the RPC company. RPC calls, a um, uh, full node can, can give you what it believes is, or what it tells you it believes is an appropriate fee. But it would be good if you could get enough data from the node to actually do that calculation yourself. Uh, as as you um, let's see, the other thing that, uh, that I think I think that's amazing. Uh, one more question, maybe? <laughs> um, it was hard of all uh, around 2011. Um, uh, yeah. And uh, I, I guess it was the last, last uh, event during the Bitcoin history. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to 
understand how it's going to be. It's it's not going to happen again um, because this time it's going to be a huge uh, major change for for Bitcoin Core, Bitcoin D, I and mean, Bitcoin XP is very different from Bitcoin D. And uh, how can I make sure myself that such catapult will not happen this time? Um, so I, I think you're asking, um, the question is like, how can you uh, know like which side of a fork you're on if a fork happens? Is that, is that kind of your question? No, I think he's more asking like, how can he be certain that there won't be a hard fork that is sustained like in 2011, uh, where like for 24 blocks, two sides of the network just kept going in you know, parallel to each other. Okay. Um, well, there's uh, lots of uh, things that uh, that um, you know, put in place for a hard fork um, to make sure that um, you don't get a sustained, um, like an actual two, two forks that are both sustained at the same time. Uh, one is that uh, you make sure that a uh, very high percentage of all the um, mining power on the network has indicated that they are ready to switch over to fork. So when they when they mine a block, they include a version that they plan to support. And uh, that version doesn't take effect until something like, uh, say, 75 or 80 or 90 percent of like, the last 1,000 blocks uh, agree. That way, uh, when a fork does happen, um, because the, let's say a small percentage, 10 percent or, or something like that, is uh, using Old code that doesn't follow the fork, um, then that fork uh, will take 10 times longer to grow, and so it'll be just a, an orphan chain, and the, the correct chain will be very obvious. And then, secondly, anybody spending any kind of, of resources uh, is going to be losing lots of time when that happens. Uh, so, they have a strong economic incentive to very quickly switch and, and update the they really didn't like the idea and genuinely wanted to protest. Even in that situation, they have a strong economic incentive to go along with what everybody else goes along with. Uh, they personally disagree with it. Uh, this is you know, similar to uh, the network effects that you have with money in general, that uh, when you have a monetary commodity, you want to hold what everybody else wants to hold. And so that's why you tend to have kind of a winner take all situation. It's the same with, uh, with, with Bitcoin with the fork, is that uh, you have one clear winner uh, because of the economic incentives involved. It's almost impossible to have two forks uh, that are actually you know, comparable and both uh, going at the same time and having an actual split in the network. There's just too much strong of an economic incentive to not do that. So just like you, know, you see that with altcoins, uh, they have something like five or ten percent of, of the crypto um, market cap and Bitcoin has like 90 or 95 percent of the crypto market cap. It's the same reason that there is just a natural incentive to have for everyone to standardize on, on the same thing. Even if they personally don't like it, what matters and more important is that you pick what everybody else picks. So I think that's what ultimately prevents uh, to uh, have the actual network split. All right. About that. So, uh, thank you all for coming and uh, really appreciate it. I, I love Japan. I uh, had a great time and uh, thanks for inviting me.